In this 20-minute presentation, you'll hear from Connor Stanfield, class of 21, as he talks about his mentored advanced project, a staging of the International Stud in relationship to pieces on display in Grinnell College Museum of Arts exhibition, Face Forward, curated by Daniel Strong. Speaking across disciplines, Connor unpacks the play and the artworks, considering queerness, the value of self-portrayal, and how to open ourselves up to love. Great to be back doing 20 minutes at 11. And today we are going to be hearing from Connor Stanfield, who's class of 21, uh, and has been working on a map with uh, Professor Craig Quintero in theater. Um, I don't know how much, Connor, you want me to say about the background or if you're going to give all that detail about what you've been sort of fleshing out. But I have to say, we are always so excited when students want to cross across disciplines and work with the art collection and have it help them broaden how they're thinking about the work that they're doing and the scholarship that they're engaged with. Um, and we're especially delighted when you can bring that back to looking at the art itself and help us think about the art we have in new ways. So we're excited to hear from you. And I think with that, I'm going to give the rest of the 20 minutes to you. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I will talk a little bit about the, the context of my map. Um, so I've just started the share during the presentation. But yeah, I just want to again thank everyone at the Grinnell College Museum of Art for having me today and to everyone else for showing up. Um, I'm Connor Stanfield, he, him, uh, fourth year sociology and theater and dance major, and I'll be giving this talk called Face Inward uh, on the interrelationships between uh, my map and the, the works uh, in the exhibition in the gallery right now um, in Face Forward. Um, so just to start off with some background and context about my map. Um, so I'm doing a theater map, which is a virtual staging of the International Stud, which is the first part of Harvey Firestein's Torch Song trilogy. Um, so this play follows um, a drag queen named Arnold, and uh, the first part is his relationship with uh, this man named Ed. So I've been working on this map throughout this semester. Um, the first term was focused more on dramaturgical research, so placing the International Stud in it historical and artistic context. And then this term is focused on the staging of it, which will culminate in like a live streamed Zoom production of the International Stud. So we just had our first cast meeting last night, so I'm really, really excited about that. Um, but as I was doing my dramaturgical research, I went to the gallery just to look around uh, at Face Forward, and I was really struck by the interrelationships between uh, what I saw in, in the gallery and what I had been researching. And it also helped me to look at my own work uh, and the International Stud in a new way. So one thing that I started strongly considering after visiting the gallery was uh, how I could think of the International Stud as a portrait. So when I think of the portrait, I usually think of these more traditional things like, like a photograph or an oil painting or, or something like that. Um, uh, a still piece of visual media. And so I wanted to consider, as I, as I mentioned, the, the whole trilogy focuses on Arnold. Um, and there's a note at the beginning that says that um, through this play, these characters will reveal more to themselves than you know, your closest friends would reveal to you. Um, so I think there is a way that similarly to a portrait, this play gives a really um, in-depth understanding of all of the things that, that make Arnold him um, in a very vulnerable way. I also started thinking about uh, representation in art and who do we consider worthy uh, of being the subject of art, of being portrayed. And I think that the juxtaposition between these two pieces, which are right next to each other in the exhibition, really helped to exemplify that. So uh, in sort of like this classical idea of art and also in the classical idea of theater, um, we have portraits of of royal people, the elite of society. And that's really well exemplified by the oil painting on the right from the 17th century. Um, and even in theater, in, in classical Greek drama, the a tragedy had to be about a royal or, or an elite and how they fell from that status. Even if you think about a lot of Shakespeare's work later on, things like Macbeth, Hamlet, all of that is focused on royalty. And then as we've progressed into the 20th century and into the 21st century, both visual art and theater have become a lot more interested in representing the everyday subject. 
and not only the everyday subject, but also those who subvert the status quo, who might be considered deviants. And I think that Catherine Opie's self-portrait really well reflects that. That not only is she not royalty, but she's also the gender non-conforming subject. She is going consciously going against um, the values of society. And I think that the International Stud also does that in an interesting way where it is portraying this, this gay Jewish drag queen who has like public sex during the play, completely going against the standard values of society. Um, and I also think there's a there's an interesting juxtaposition, especially in him being a drag queen, where he is fulfilling sort of this idea of royalty and um, gender nonconformity at the same time. Um, to speak a little bit more about gender nonconformity and queer masculinities, that has been one of the, the main themes of my research, especially as I consider what was queer masculinity in the 1970s, what is it today, and how do we connect the two of them? Um, and that is really well, well represented, represented, especially by two works, I think, in the exhibition. The first being Kenny New Orleans, which I have here. Um, one thing that I found really interesting was that Alex Soth, as he was looking for people to photograph for this series, he asked uh, communities, like, who is somebody who knows how to fill up a room, who knows how to take up space? And so obviously the person pictured here does that. And I, thinking uh, back to the International Stud, I was certain that Arnold, who's the main character, would definitely be one of those people who knows how to fill up a room, how to take up space. And I thought it was interesting that both of those people are gender non-conforming in a way. Um, and I was wondering why that is. And I think there is something about the way that these people are told that they should not exist and they should not exist in this way and internally therefore they have to develop this certain sense of taking up space and know how to do that very consciously and therefore end up being able to consciously take up space in a way that many of us never have to learn how to do so and how that can be seen as a skill and a virtue also, in a lot of the uh, reviews of different productions of Torch Song Trilogy, uh, different critics will note how uh, Arnold's humor, he has this really big bombastic humor throughout the play, and how he uses that to mask this emotional core. And so I thought there was an interesting connection between this idea of taking up space as a way to, to fight against this internal sense of, of not belonging and being told they don't have a right to exist, and using humor in a similar way to take up a big amount of space to combat those same ideas. Um, another work that really caught my eye, this is one of my favorite works in the college's collection, um, is Now is Enough by James Goble. And I think this does a great job of representing queer masculinity today. Um, to talk more about queer masculinity in my research, um, in the 1970s, um, there's this image of the gay clone, which was this gay uh, beauty standard that emerged at the beginning of the 1970s. It started off as this big muscular man with a special focus on his barrel chest, usually very hairy chest as well, um, a very hyper-masculine, white, exclusive figure. Um, and throughout the 70s, this evolved. In the middle of the 70s, they started adding more costumey elements to it. So maybe um, a police officer's uniform or a bunch of like BDSM gear or a cowboy hat or something like that. If you know the village people, their costumes were directly inspired by this image of the gay clone. Then towards the end of the 70s, they lost the costumes and they even lost the head of this figure. So it was just this torso of a very muscular, a very masculine and a very white uh, torso. And this image was ubiquitous throughout the gay community and everywhere you looked in every magazine and every gay gay bookstore or gay club it was represented somehow and of course tacit in that image is the recognition that anyone who does not fit into that is therefore not ideal so anyone who might be feminine might be a person of color might have a different body type is excluded in a way from the gay community and although that image doesn't necessarily persist today, I don't think most queer people would recognize the language of the gay clone. They would recognize the image for sure. Um, if anything has shifted, it's just the focus from the chest to abs in terms of gay male beauty standards. And so what I really love about Now is Enough by James Goble is the way that it completely rejects all of these elements of this uh, gay male beauty standard um, both in terms of like the form and, the, and um, the, the appearance of it and in its composition. So you have this, this 
fat man of color who is very feminine being portrayed in this very beautiful way. And even in the materials that it uses in terms of felt and, and sequins and that sort of thing, it rejects sort of this hardness and it embraces the softness related to queer masculinity, which I think is also something that Feierstein was attempting to do in the international stud. Um, another thing that really caught my eye, um, which was a, a connection I was not expecting to make at all, is this importance of self portrayal um, in Aida Malune's work throughout the exhibition. So she has a lot of really incredible work here. Um, I just have a picture of this one, The Resilience of Beauty. Um, and in the description of Malune's work, it says that she was interested in reclaiming this colonial gaze of Africa, which cast Africa as alternatively either exotic and beautiful or wild and uncontrollable and savage. And she wanted to recognize that neither of those things fully encapsulate what Africa is or accurately describe it. So she wanted to portray Africa as an African woman on its own terms. Um, and the international stud in a much earlier time and in a different way was trying to do the same thing. So in the 1970s, there had started to be some representation of gay people in, in theater and on film, um, but this representation was not very good. It, uh, either cast gay men as these deviant sexual figures who were just obsessed with sex and that was all they were thinking about and all they were doing all the time, or they were these tragic figures who were obsessed with the, with how they were gay and how that had completely ruined their lives and they were bitter and self-loathing because of that. For example, The Boys in the Band, which was on Broadway um, before Torch Song Trilogy was, most of these characters fit into that category of they're just bitter, mean, self-loathing, specifically because they're gay. And so uh, Harvey Firestein, with writing Torch Song Trilogy, he wanted to expand on that representation of a gay man to even accept that, yes, uh, gay men in the 1970s were having lots of sex in, in different ways than the norm, but this wasn't the entirety of who they were as, as human beings. And there was tragedy in their lives, but it wasn't necessarily because they were gay. Um, an important quote I remember from uh, one review of a production of Torch Song Trilogy is that um, homosexuality is the arena for his problems, but it is not his problems. So I think that's a really important distinction um, to make. So I, I definitely don't want to compare colonialism to homophobia, but I think there are interesting connections between Moulinet's goals and Firestein's goals as artists. Um, to finish this off, I want to talk about uh, one quote from the from Porch Song Trilogy. So this is from Arnold's opening monologue as he's getting into drag. And he says, I guess a drag queen's like being an oil painting. You got to stand back from it to get the full effect. And so obviously this has a really great application to Lucas Lash Rug by Chuck Close. Um, when I saw this in the exhibition at first, it took me a while. I had to fully look at it and figure out what I was looking at. And once I stepped back, I got to see it in, you know, in its entirety. Um, it's this really beautiful work. Um, and what Arnold is referring to in here is the way that he keeps people at a distance so that they are not able to hyperfixate on the things like I was talking about earlier, like the tragedy of, of being gay and of coming out or the deviance of their sexuality. And rather they have to look at him as a whole person in the same way. If you think of like Lucas Lash Rug, you're not going to fully understand this work if you just hyperfixate on one small section of it or on one of those little ellipses that he draws. You're only able to understand what this work is trying to do if you step back from it and look at it fully. And so I think that is one important thing to consider in interactions with other people is that in order to view people with respect for their full humanity, it's often necessary to take the step back and look at them fully rather than fixating on small parts of them. On the other hand, I want to consider this quote from the other perspective, because Arnold is talking about how he uses this as a way to keep people away from him to not be vulnerable with other people. So I was considering uh, Charles Bierk's work. Uh, I think Jonas too does a really great job of exemplifying this. Um, if you've seen this in person in the exhibition, it's incredible. It's just huge. And each one of even the hairs in his beard is so delicately drawn um, you know, they're probably about the size of my forearm, these brush strokes. And you only really fully appreciate the, the mastery of Bjerg's work by seeing it in that up close and looking at the incredible detail that went into creating this. And I think that this is also true 
of our relationships with other people. We are only able to fully appreciate others and all of the all of the complexities and the intricacies of who they are as human beings by looking at them closely. Um, and of course, that requires a great deal of vulnerability on our part to allow ourselves to be viewed in that way. So I was really interested in this juxtaposition of how do we allow ourselves to both be viewed up close uh, where people can see all of the brush strokes that make up who we are as human beings, but then also recognize that they have to step away and to see us as, as a full work of art ourselves in order to fully appreciate our humanity. Um, so that is what I'm going to leave you all with, uh, and I would love to open the floor back up to you all for any sort of questions or discussions. Thank you. Um, I didn't touch on as much the, the struggle that Firestein went through in, in initially staging and writing this work. So um, when he initially staged it, uh, and he initially like pitched this idea for the international stud, the, the director and, and owner of the space was like, no, you are not allowed to, you can't stage this here. Um, because the international stud at the time was known as one of like the raunchiest gay bars in New York City. And he really did struggle to to stage it. Uh, the initial reviews of it were, they called it a, a sensationalized and sentimental portrait of a drag queen in a very condescending way where this was not something that a general public could relate to or understand. Um, and it really wasn't until the full trilogy wa was performed all together in 1982 that people even started seeing it as, as anything valuable at all. Um, so there definitely is, was a huge courage and a lot of opposition that he faced, even in these progressive, uh, like artistic spaces um, that, you know, we would think would be much more open minded, but they were totally resistant to him even staging the work at all. Are you going to actually perform the work? I'm, I'm not, I wasn't totally clear on, on whether this was a study of the work or if you're actually going to perform it. Yeah, so we are going to perform the work at the end of this term. Um, so I, I will be playing Arnold. Um, Ahon, who's right here, will be playing Ed. Um, so it's really, I'm really excited to to fully dive in to the, the production of the work. Um, and I think it is, it's something that we've been really strongly considering about um, the, the fact that it was so shocking and so um, so forward in, in 1978 when it was first performed, that now how do we retain some of that and recognize the, the struggle and the courage that went into producing it? When now we really can think of it as, as just a celebration um, when there's so much more to it than that. Talking about portraiture ahead of seeing this exhibition, or did that you think differently about the play? It definitely um, was something, it was not something I was thinking of before the exhibition. I, um, and even I talked with Tilly after seeing it, and it wasn't until after my conversation with Tilly that I realized, oh, this might be a portrait in a way. Um, and I think it has been really great to to think of it in that way and think of, you know, if a portrait maybe has brush strokes, then how is that represented in, in theater? Um, I don't know, I'm just really excited to think of all the different ways of applying like the ideas and I don't know, theoretical ideas about portraiture to a play, which is not something I had considered at all beforehand. That's great, I love it. Wonderful connections being made. Thank you everyone once again. Like this was a really special uh, experience for me and I'm, I'm really glad that it worked out so well. <laughs>